mic'd up here, and then I'll explain what all those words mean in my title. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, I'm going to talk to you this morning. First of all, how's everybody doing? How's everybody doing? All right. I'm, I'm going to talk to you this morning about some work I've been doing with Joe Galuski uh, on using atmospheric models, climate models, to give us, uh, to drive landscape evolution models, drive or provide input for the landscape evolution model. Um, and so I'm going to start off by introducing you to our amazing field setting and the natural experiment it provides. Uh, and, and then I'm going to talk about how the modeling, the modeling kind of plays into our research strategy there. And in that context, I hope to highlight some of the issues of scale, space and time scales. You guys can hear me, right? Space and time scales that, uh, that come up when you're crossing these, uh, these kind of modeling boundaries. Uh, all right, so here's Hawaii, 20 degrees south, which puts it uh, in the uh, northeast trade wind zone in the subtropics, and it's in the descending limb of the Hadley circulation. Uh, so, uh, so we have descending Hadley circulation air coming down uh, in this area, and it's very dry. It's coming down from the top of the troposphere. And uh, so you can see this low cloud deck as I'm flying into Hawaii, this is the big island underneath me. Uh, there's, a, there's a Maui out there in the distance. And you can see it poking up above this cloud deck, which is, uh, which is constrained in height by a temperature inversion uh, that forms as a result of the interaction of this descending Hadley air, uh, which is he getting warmer adiabatically as it, as it comes down. Um, so this descending air intersects the maritime boundary layer very warm, moist air, and uh, you form clouds, and there's, uh, there's radiation effects. slides back here. Thanks. I'm not usually this technically challenged. Oh, now it sounds like I'm on. Okay. So anyway, uh, you form these clouds uh, that, uh, the, uh, and you end up with uh, long wave radiation from the tops of the clouds, uh, short wave absorption. There's turbulent entrainment at this interface of dry air from, that's, uh, that's uh, descending into the marine boundary layer, and then uh, there's evaporative cooling associated with that. The net effect of all of this uh, is to create a temperature inversion uh, that caps the cloud layer and appears something like 85% of, of days. It's very consistent. It appears across the subtropics because of these effects. Um, this is a uh, this is a radioson profile that uh, there's one of the, there's a balloon goes up from Hilo uh, twice a day. Um, this is from the day that this picture was taken. I just dug into the archive and found the right afternoon. Um, and so height versus temperature, and you can see a strong temperature inversion right here. Uh, you know, six or seven degrees C at about 1,500 meters. Uh, as I said, this occurs across the subtropics. Um, as you move from uh, the subtropical high over towards the, uh, uh, the intertropical conversion zone near the equator, um, the inversion uh, goes from very strong to, very, to much weaker. And uh, you start to get in it. It rises in elevation. As you do that, it's influenced by sea surface temperature, as you might expect, and it's also the height of that is also influenced by uh, the uh, strength of the trade winds. Um, but the statistics of the inversion height are fairly well characterized. Uh, and just a paper from Chow and others. Um, the, so at Hilo, 17% of the time, 
there's not an inversion, but the inversion is there the rest of the time. Um, and so from these radio sound uh, data sets, you can pull out the statistics of this. You can see there's some seasonal variation. The frequency of inversion goes down in the midsummer when temperatures are a little bit warmer in the boundary layer. Um, and uh, the height of the inversion goes up there, which is consistent with that height increasing towards the equator. Uh, so this is, these, these, these statistics can provide constraint on climate models that, that, that manifest the inversion in uh, the modern setting. At the last glacial maximum, sea surface temperatures are probably different, wind speeds and patterns were probably different. And so this was, these statistics might have shifted, but it's not really well explored how in a particular setting such as Hawaii. There's also topographic interactions. So here's what it looks, here's the, how the inversion manifests itself on the island. Uh, so uh, here's, here's Hilo, um, Mauna Kea where the observatories are, and Mauna Loa where the other observatories are. Um, and you can see this very sharp dividing line uh, between vegetated and not vegetated. And that's because that's about the average elevation of the inversion, where the inversion layer caps those, those clouds. And so you have steady drizzle all the time below that when these clouds form and uh, basically desert conditions above, which is why it's good for the observatories. Um, so here's the tropical rainfall measuring measurement mission data averaged from uh, 1998 to 2008, or it's the, uh, probably the monthly average. Or, or, yeah. So um, you can see the scale bar here. That's not a typo. There's not a period missing there. It's 2.7 meters of rain per year that trim is picking up, and that's probably an underestimate. Gauges, gauges in here show at least isolated places where it's more like four meters of rain a year. Um, and, uh, you know, a couple tens of millimeters a year up in, uh, up in this upper elevation, mostly delivered by frontal storms that pass through. Um, this is the average inversion height from that uh, histogram. And you can see that it draws a beautiful bullseye around these, uh, these areas of very low precipitation. Uh, and the river networks, as you might expect, are responding to this. This is the mapped hydrology, just the USGS mapped hydrology. And uh, this blank patch in here is mostly because it's very young lava flows uh, on, on Mauna Loa. But you have, uh, you have high drainage densities I'll just zoom in a little bit here. You can see as you come down from the top of the mountain, there's a very few well-developed channels that are you know, mapped by the USGS. You get down um, below the inversion where you have perpetual drizzle, and you start to have uh, uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of river channels, a very dense drainage network. Uh, a little bit about the geology, because uh, that's relevant here. Um, the uh, lava flows on Mauna Kea that we're interested in are in the tens to hundreds of thousands of years old. So these, uh, the, the landscape here has evolved over at least one and maybe a couple of glacial, glacial interglacial cycles. So it's important to understand how, uh, how the uh, properties of the, uh, the inversion and the rainfall distribution have changed um, in, the, in those two different kinds of climate extremes. Uh, just, the just the hydrology again, just plotted a little differently on top of the geology. Um, and I'll point out that there was an ice cap on Mauna Kea, not just at LGM, but uh, several stages prior. It's very well described by Stephen Porter in 1979. And there's been some recent work doing cosmogenic dating to nail down the timing of uh, deglaciation in the glacial stages. and uh, and the last deglaciation was about uh, 15,000 years ago. There's also good evidence that there were outburst floods uh, occasionally from, from this ice cap on the top of the mountain, which would have very quickly dumped a lot of water into the top of the drainage network, which uh, uh, is very different from the very bottom heavy signal that you see because of the inversion. Uh, I'll just take you on a very quick photographic tour. Um, uh, this is up at 3,800 meters near the top of the mountain, right about at the glacial limit.
photo is a little dark, but you can see uh, this is just kind of the boundaries of lava flows and a cinder cone here. But uh, you have uh, there's a channel head that starts kind of in this depression and wanders off down the hill over the mountain. But you can imagine that that doesn't see a lot of flow. The desert is very rocky. Um, you get down to about 3,000 meters, you're starting to pick up some scrubby vegetation. Um, and you can follow these channels down. There's very nice scouring features even up here where you don't have much discharge. And so at times, there must be a fair amount of water moving through these things, uh, carrying sediment to abrade the, uh, abrade the bed. Right now, the only water in this pothole is in this plastic bubble. Uh, moving down to about 2,000 meters, a little bit more continuous vegetation cover. You're kind of in the grazing zone. There's been a fair amount of ranching that's gone on, so that's impacting it. The channels look vaguely the same. You see the same kind of scouring potholes and things. And still, no perennial flow, very ephemeral. Um, getting down to about 1,100 meters, now you're, now you're kind of below the, you're starting to get down into the clouds, below, well below the inversion that caps them. Um, this doesn't really show up, but there's a trickle of water coming down here. You can see the ripples. Um, that's a spring, so you're starting to pick up groundwater. Um, and you, you start to have perennial flow at some low level in the streams. Uh, as you get, as you imagine, down towards sea level, you start to have much higher perennial discharges. Um, and you get these big nick points, big waterfalls um, that are probably good for showering under. Um, and again, down low, compared to the really rocky, thin soils above, uh, you have these big, thick, saprolites and weathered, uh, deeply weathered red soils, um, which are going to impact the hydrology. They're going to impact uh, the hill slopes, uh, delivery of sediments, channels, and so forth. Um, let's take a look at a couple hydrographs from gauges at the uh, Wailuka River, which has this big drainage area here, um, and Honolulu Stream, which kind of runs up into here and, and peters out and doesn't have a lot of tributaries. Um, uh, that's just kind of the throw it up there. These, these records actually go back pretty continuously to the 50s and, and uh, back to the 1917, I think, sporadically before that. Yeah, so the Wailuka drainage area is hundreds of square kilometers. Honolulu is about 30. But um, when I blow it up and just look at the past couple of years, um, you can see that the, the hydrographs are pretty, they're, you know, pretty similar to each other. The bigger drainage area, you know, tails off more slowly uh, in the, the falling stages of uh, these, these storm events or these, these runoff events, which are almost certainly uh, frontal storms and occasional tropical cyclones. Um, so it's important to understand this because the, the inversion might cause this pinning of the clouds and meters of rainfall a year down low, but it's falling as a slow drizzle. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not making a really flashy hydrograph, but then you get these storms that come through and several orders of magnitude higher discharges uh, when that happens. And, the, um, and so what's, you know, what's doing the geomorphic work? Um, so I'm going to start with a, uh, a few examples of the scientific questions that this setting uh, gives us. Um, it's like, to what extent does discharge variability impact the fluvial erosion rates, uh, both above and below the inversion layer, as you go from ephemeral to perennial streams? Um, was the LGM fluvial system more top-heavy because you had an ice cap sitting up there um, than it is currently? Uh, how does the delivery to the sediment, of sediment to the channels, how is that affected by the deeply weathered soils down low? And, um, and uh, how are the, positions of, are the positions of the large nick points better explained by stream discharge or just by when, whenever they were kicked off by landsliding at the coast or something else? These are the kinds of questions we can ask. I could, I could go four slides of this. And I'm sure you guys can do it too. So, you can imagine a number of approaches to, to looking at this, but one of the things we want to do is, is uh, 
first is use uh, modeling, atmospheric modeling, to, uh, to try to estimate the precipitation changes that might happen over these glacial interglacial time scales, and uh, then and come up with uh, the hydrological impacts of that. Um, so we want to simulate the modern precipitation climatology at the relevant scales, uh, which you know, we're going to use something like a regional climate model, and you need data to drive that. Um, the, uh, we want to characterize the glacial interglacial changes to inversion height, storm frequency, temperature, hydrology. Um, uh, and so we need, uh, we need to be able to drive our regional climate model with last glacial maximum boundary conditions. Uh, which you might get from a, a GCM run that uh, was set up for the last glacial maximum. Um, and we want to incorporate these changes into a landscape evolution model to narrow down hypotheses uh, about, you know, about the scientific questions that we had just asked before we go out and, and spend a lot of money putting in sensors. And um, you know, we want to, what are we going to measure when we go out there? If you do the modeling first, you have a better idea of what to target. Um, and so we need a hydrologic simulation that captures the daily to seasonal hydrograph, the glacial interglacial precipitation changes, and then critically responds to channel network evolution over longer time scales, like you might get from a landscape evolution model. Apologize for the big, messy, unbroken up slide. But uh, so we're going to take. A, so what we're going to do is we're going to take global scale climate model output uh, at something like one degree resolution. Um, and we're going to use it to drive a regional scale climate model at kilometer kind of scale resolution. Um, and uh, use the mapped hydrology and uh, geology to, uh, to, to simulate hydrographs using a hyd hydrologic model and use the, uh, use the statistics of discharge from that um, somehow to, uh, to, to drive a landscape evolution model to, to test some of these uh, geomorph hypotheses. All right, so about the scales of these models. Uh, global climate models, here's, uh, here's spatial, spatial resolution up here and time step. So minimum resolution, minimum time resolution. Uh, GCMs tend to sit up here, tens to hundreds of kilometers, a degree is a common uh, size. Um, and, but time steps of a second to a minute or so, um, depending on the physics you're using. Regional climate models, uh, you know, you, can, you come down to the 100 meter scale. Um, but again, they're, you're integrating on very short time steps. Um, the hydro hydrologic models, also you generally pretty short time steps if you want to resolve daily hydrographs and things like that. Um, and you might do that at tens to 100 meter resolution for a, a, a particular watershed. Um, big hole in the time scale here. Uh, and then you have landscape evolution models. Uh, again, at the watershed scale, uh, but uh, time steps of a year, 100, 10 years, 100 years, depending on the physics. Um, so uh, the, uh, the time step of a landscape evolution model might be longer than the enti an entire climatological length run of a GCM. So incorporating the variability that you get from the fields derived from these GCMs into something that's integrating over these very long time scales is tricky. Uh, for, so, so what we're going to do, we're going to take output from global climate model simulations. These have been run um, by people who do that. I'm not one of them. Um, we're going to use those output fields as boundary conditions for our regional climate model. So we're doing dynamical downscaling here. And so that'll allow us to get some, you know, we'll have storms moving through. We'll have the inversion moving up and down with different conditions. We'll have some of this variability that's important. Um, and then we can take those precipitation fields and put them over topo flow or, or integrate them with par flow or, you know, uh, put them into a hydrologic model. That's, you know, that's, that, that can be done. That's been done. 
Um, and then we, then we have to bridge this gap here. Um, so we're going to use uh, WARF, NCAR's uh, weather research and forecasting model, um, to, uh, to do the dynamical downscaling. Uh, it's a fully compressible, non-hydrostatic atmospheric climate simulation that's doing the fluid dynamics of the atmosphere, um, along with physics for precipitation and, and so forth, radiation. Um, WARF allows you to use domain nesting, so you can take a, a, a very low spatial or high spatial resolution. Or you can go to a high spatial resolution from very low spatial resolution in several steps. Um, so if we're going to simulate at the kilometer scale and our input fields are from a GCM at the one degree scale, we can, uh, can kind of step down into that. And I'll show you the effects of that and why it's, it's kind of important. Um, WARF can ingest climate model output. Uh, uh, we need to do that. It can take reanalysis data, station observations. It can take all kinds of input to use as boundary conditions. Um, and uh, uh, the CCSM folks have recently rerun some of their parts of their 20th century and LGM runs at with six hourly output, which is what you need for WARF to do a good job. So uh, those are just becoming available in the last you know, uh, six months or so. All right, so here's what we're working with. Uh, the, uh, this would be like, so the one degree box is the size of the island. That's your input field from a global climate model. Um, and just as an example with the topography, here's the topography of Hawaii with, uh, at 48 kilometer resolution. This would be like an outer, outer nest in wharf. Um, and you can see it doesn't do a particularly good job of representing the island. Um, in fact, the island is, doesn't even poke up above the inversion in this, uh, at this resolution. So you've got to go a little farther in. We're still missing one of the mountains here, basically. You're doing a little better on the overall elevation at 16 kilometers. But to really resolve these ter the terrain interactions with the inversion, we're going to need to do something in the five five-ish kilometer range. And you can go extreme with that, but uh, and that's seven. But you're, you're getting pretty close. Um, at, at five kilometers, you're getting pretty close to the right elevations and, and things like that. Um, so this is, this is downscaled CCSM output at 48 kilometers. I'm not going to make much of it. This is from a test run that I did just to make things work, and it's, it's not quite right for interpreting. But uh, this is a cloud water mixing ratio. Um, and you, know, you can see it's, it's making clouds on the right side of the island at this resolution. So it is feeling the topography to some extent. But you don't, you don't get much out of that if, if you need the spatial variability that we have. Um, as you come down to 16 kilometers, you start to do a little better. You, you know, you're resolving the gap between the two mountains. Um, and again, five kilometers start to resolve these things. Just as a sort of aside, but a very relevant one, we're not the only ones with scale issues. Um, climate models in general, not just WARF or CCSM in general, uh, have this kind of disparity of scales where, you know, at, at, the, low, at the small spatial resolution, um, the uh, dynamics are fully resolved, you're starting to, you're resolving the turbulent structures in the atmosphere explicitly uh, from the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, and so the physics, you know, work based on that. Whereas at these big scales, you can't resolve those, those kind of cloud forming eddies and, and things that you need. So there's, there's parameterized physics out at those scales. Those have been pretty well tested and calibrated based on modern observations. So both of these work pretty well, but this, this area in the middle, which is importantly the kind of resolution that we want for putting into landscape models, you're starting to resolve some of those eddies, but you're not fully resolving them. So you have this weird mix of parameterized physics and resolved physics, and it, it's, uh, there's kind of a scale gap there. And uh, the, the output is maybe not as reliable as it, we would want it to be compared to one if running at these other scales. And it's also hard to go from something um, at giving boundary conditions at, at these high scales, or these, these high DXs, um, 
and jump across that gap without the physics getting weird. Um, so we're not the only community with spatial scale issues. Um, it's back to our, uh, yeah. so, so these guys are all, you know, this modeling chain has been done, it can be done. Uh, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk very briefly as I finish up about the, uh, this hydrologic gap, which I, I don't really know how uh, we're going to go from there to there. There's a number of strategies out there. I'll, I'll talk just briefly about that. First, a big ugly slide of bullet points. Um, the statistics of flow are important because the big events do the most work. I showed you the hydrographs. Um, landscape evolution models tend to have basic hydrology in them, but it's not the you know it's not fully resolved with groundwater and things like that. Um, and and you know all the water tends to run off instantly because you're running on a time step of a year, which is longer than it takes for the water to run off. Um, uh, you can use hydrologic models to do the hydrographs pretty well, um, but they run at too small a time step, time step to reasonably do a long LA, uh, landscape run, uh, in, including that. Um, but you do have to have feedbacks between, a, between the channel network as it evolves and the hydrology, and so you can't just take a static discharge map and run it forward in, a, in an LEM. Um, and so, as uh, Mike Perch pointed out the other day, statistics know nothing about time. And so I think the answer to this, at least for the moment, is, is to take a statistical kind of approach. Um, this is, I couldn't find the original figure for some reason, but, um, you know, so landscape evolution models uh, tend to include something, can include something like a stochastic rainfall approach, where you put water on the landscape in, in precipitation events that have a distribution of intensities and durations and then time between these storm events. It's child works this way and, and so forth. But, um, but it's not clear that in all settings the, the kind of artificial hydrographs that this approach generates, may, you know, they may or may not be realistic for a given uh, setting, especially when the spatial variability is important. That's an area, but they might. That's an active area of work that needs to, needs to be done. Um, we can take our real hydrographs, we can take, uh, or synthetic hydrographs that are you know, tuned to these real ones uh, uh, from a hydrologic model and collect statistics. Um, this guy looks sort of log normal. Collect statistics of, uh, of discharge. Um, and so we want some way to map those into a landscape evolution model but you're not mapping it into just here's water on a landscape and it's going through your LEM. You're mapping it into the, exist the drainage network of the LEM as it evolves, which is tricky. It's going to require some cleverness. I don't know the answer to this problem. This is a gauntlet I'm throwing to the community here. Um, or maybe some of you have solved this. I don't know. Come talk to me if you have. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but you could do something like uh, you could build uh, a probability distribution of discharge um, and then parameterize that distribution just a, simply, maybe like a mean and a standard deviation, which, uh, and you could, you, could, you could plot up how they, uh, how each of those parameters in the distribution should scale with nominal drainage area in your LEM or uh, nominal discharge with a basic um, you know, with a basic hydrology, and then, uh, you know, incorporate that so you can cleverly map uh, these discharge statistics into the channel network based on the properties of the channel network that the LEM is calculating. Um, um, and or make use of newer transport uh, and erosion laws that have been developed in the last few years that explicitly incorporate discharge statistics and some of the, uh, some of the parameterized distributions of discharge. That's the kind of approach that I'm aiming for to bridge this hydrologic scale gap. But that's, this is a very important uh, aspect of, of this kind of work. And if we want to keep doing this, using these climate models to run LEMs, we're going to have to come up with ways to do this. All right, so I'm done. Um, if I can get a bullet point. There we go.
So, in summary, new CCSM output for LGM in 20th century allows us to do dynamical downscaling for LGM. We can look at LGM climate in the appropriate spatial resolution. But important scale gaps still exist between these different kinds of models. And until we each have a petaflop iPhone in our pocket and we can integrate million year landscape runs at climate model time steps, we're going to need to take some kind of statistical approach uh, to, to crossing that scale gap. And before I take questions, I'm going to take 30 seconds to pimp a, my uh, AGU session here. Um, uh, we have some exciting invited speakers. Nicole Gasparini is one. Um, Colin Stark, Ben uh, Crosby, and Joel Pedersen. And a lot of non-invited talks that are going to be very exciting. Uh, and so I invite you to check that out if you're going to be at AGU. Thank you. Okay, questions uh, for Dylan. Who's got a solution to his hydrograph problem? Any questions? Nope. Stumped them. Stumped them. They're still writing their equations. Okay. Great. Thanks, Dylan. Thanks, James.